of the previous topics has to be very much understood and um, absorbed by the serious side. So this Atrashargopishargascha, this is the creation and the sub-creation. This is described, the creation is described in 3rd Canto, chapter 6. And the sub-creation is by Lord Brahma. This is also in the third canto, chapter 20. Try to have it in this life in our hands, this Bhagavatam. Actually, when you read the commentaries of Sri Krishna Chakrani Thakur and Sri Jiva Goswami, they are literally running up and down the Bhagavatam. <coughs> all of their commentaries are just making reference to all aspects of the Bhagavatam because it's all part of the whole. You can't separate, you can't say, oh, my heart is the most important. Feature. It may be the most important feature, but if you disregard the hands and the legs and the head and the rest of the body, etc., then how are you going to function? So all aspects of the body have to be functioning, including the heart, which is actually the ashraya, which is the ryojin type. So without that um, being made prominent, as Shil Gurudev just said, in his lecture just now, in Bajra, he's just emphasizing this point, because you can get left behind in paying attention too much to the hands and the legs and the summer, etc. Just be looking books only, but not understanding the subject matter of the book. So, Akra Sarva, Vishaka Shachar. Stanam. Stanam means depending on Krishna. Stanam, that's Sita. That, or depending on Vishnu, actually, in the proper terminology. Vishnu. Vishnu is there. The supreme control, the supreme support. And then Poshana how Krishna's devotees are supported by him, by Vishnu. All the way through, this is like the fifth canto, you have, or the sixth canto, rather. Ajami and Indra and uh, Chitra Ketu. 
these personalities, they're shown this portion aspect. And then Manvantara, all the different Manvantaras are described. And then Ishana Kata, this Kata about Isha, Krishna, this sweet Kata about Krishna. And then Niroda, this is actually the destruction. This is in the 12th canto. Skip Uti. Huh? Uti. Oh, I didn't do Uti. Uti is the um, creative energy or calm vasana. It's described. And this can be positive and negative. So actually the example that's always given is Hirani Kashiku. This is the example of this Uti. It's this creative energy. And creative in a negative way. Because Hirani Kashiku was such a supreme controller in his time. So, I mean, he could produce the jewels from the ocean. He told the various astrological constellations how to come in the night sky. He directed the seasons. He directed everything. This is an example of this demoniac booty. And it's called Kamvasan. So this is understood as being in the seventh canto. And then this Nirodi is in the twelfth canto. And Muktiya, liberation, is described in the eleventh canto. And all these collectively culminate in the 10th canto, which is called the Ashraya. Now, in the Ashraya, there are two aspects to it. There's the Ashrita, which depends on the Ashraya. The Ashraya is that which is independent. And then there's the Ashrita, which all the other nine cantos embody, which depend on the 10th canto. So you can just see by that simple example. It's like, and it's open in the very beginning of the Vedanta Sutra, Atato Jivnasu Raman, this worship of Janmadi Asya Nityan, this worship in the first aphorism of Vedanta Sutra is indicating Brahman. It's indicating the Ashraya straight away. So we have to have our Sadhya set on there. But never consider to neglect the Ashrita. How are all these beautiful steps built? Srila Vishnu Chakra describes when there are prayers by the various demigods glorifying Krishna, this is also the Ashraya because it's focusing directly on Krishna. So before we begin to come into this 10th canto today, as I've done each day, we have to be very comfortable with this platform and understanding of its, it actually heightens the confidentiality because as I said yesterday, Parishit Maharaj is listening to all these very sober, very grave discussions. Pritu Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj, Shiva and Daksha, Ajamiya, all these, the Yama Dutas, Vishnu Dutas, <coughs> the um, warring between the demigods and the um, demons. And all very grave subject and the creation of the universe, etc. And the destruction of the universe is also mentioned prior to the 12th canto. But it's all very sobering. But when you come into this 10th canto, just like a door opens, a whole other atmosphere pervades of frivolity and sweetness and splendor, all based, as I described yesterday, on a backdrop of the most beautiful natural environment. All the different trees and the flowers and the birds and the animals, etc. And the cows specifically. All of this mood is very gentle and incredibly soft. Like the nature of spiritual culture itself is incredibly soft and sensitive and fully respectful and always affectionate. Envy and lust are unknown in Braj. They don't have a place. They don't have a support. That's why Lila Shanti invites them in in the form of these demons, just to show actually some connection with the material world. And of course, many reasons for the demons, as we've described in the past, you know. But the principal reason is for Krishna's entertainment also. Because in this particular pastime we're going to discuss today is Brahma, Vimo, and Lila. This is so beautiful. And this is specifically Krishna's thinking when he's taking his picnic that now he would like some actual 
extra entertainment. So then Lord Brahma is inspired to come. But prior to this, we'll make our way into this tenth canto. So yesterday we concluded with Anusura. And I described how actually Shukadeva Goswami, on hearing the enthusiasm of Parikshit's questions, wanting more of these pastimes, went into a trance of ecstasy and actually passed out. And it was described how Vyasadeva, Vinara, and the other great Rishis, they had to chant loudly to revive him. Now, when he revives, then he begins to glorify Parikshit Maharaj as being that Bhagavat Bhagavat Otama, the greatest of Bhagavats, because he is always hungry to hear these same pastimes that he's heard many times before. It's described that actually Parikshit asks a question. He says, why do you call me this Bhagavad Uttama? Why are you calling me that? The best of devotees. And then Shukadeva is responding because even if you've heard these pastimes so many times, he's seeing that you're appreciating them as if they're ever fresh, as if they're newer and newer and newer. So Paramahamsas attached to Krishna in the core of their hearts, it is their nature to talk about him at every moment, just as materialists like to discuss women <coughs> and sex life. So this is the nature of our process. They only want to hear about and discuss these very sweet and confidential topics. They're confidential because they're so intimate, because they're so personal. They're so like vulnerable, you can say. They're so soft and gentle and charming. There's nothing abrasive about any of this, because we enter this atmosphere of Raj, and it's just sublime. It's only sweet. It's only perfection of the heart's gentility. So now, as we were describing yesterday, after they <laughs> swam for a while in the stomach of Agasura, and actually died in his stomach, Krishna revived him, then now they come to the bank of the Jumana. And there's a couple of verses describing the beauty and softness of the sand of the Jumana. Again, this is contributing to the speciality of the atmosphere in this spiritual realm. And it's described how there were many beautiful um, lotuses growing in Jamuna Devi. And there were beautiful singing birds. And there was tall, very tall, wonderful, shady trees. Because at this time of the day, after the Agasura Dima, it's described, it's past noon. It's past their um, lunchtime, their dinner time. So the sun is high, so it's hot. So specifically, these shady trees are described. And it's described that they find this beautiful, soft sand. And Shri Vishnu Chakrari Thakur is saying that it is as comfortable as the lap of a mother. This is how he describes it. This place where they're all sitting. <coughs> it's as comfortable as the lap of a mother. And now they decided to take their picnic because it's past noon. So they very nicely tether the cars to a place where there's much green grass. They don't have to wander away as the pastime unfolds. This is a very pertinent point because there's no reason for them to go away. Because actually there's abundant grass there for them to actually take the whole time. And then um, they've taken their baths in the Jamuna and cleansed themselves from the stomach of Anasura. And now it's described very beautifully, and Srila Gurudev specifically describes this a number of times. How Krishna is sitting in the center of all these thousands of cowboy boys, but they're all feeling that Krishna is facing just them. And if they're not feeling that they're left out on the back of a circle, how could that be a reality in a spiritual world that someone is feeling they're right at the back of the queue, or right at the back of the circle? They're all Nitya Siddha Parikas. 
And they're all experiencing this close proximity with Krishna directly. Krishna sitting in the center in the whorl of a lotus flower as described. And this is also um, described in Bhagavad Gita, in the 13th chapter, 14th verse, that everywhere are his hands, eyes, legs, heads, faces, etc. So this is also a confirmation from the Bhagavad Gita. So unless, of course, we've appreciated these previous scriptures, how can we really relish these topics fully? How is it possible? If you're in the center, if you're looking this way, there's got to be people on the other side looking no, at his back. Krishna is simultaneously turning around. Krishna is showing to every single... Just like when he performs the Rasa Lila, he's dancing one Krishna between two gopis. And each gopi is thinking, well, only I can dance with Krishna. They don't even see the other gopi. So what to speak of this little exhibition of Aishwarya? But it's not Aishwarya. I, I hope you understand this point. I haven't actually specifically explained it. But something that is Aishwarya means that everybody perceiving that considers it beyond human pastimes. Just like in Puri Dham, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is dancing and fountains like sprays of tears are coming from him, everyone's thinking, oh, this must be the Supreme Personality of God here, to exhibit such a remarkable pastime. So they are all thinking that he is God. But in the brush pastimes, it's never, they, the, the, the cowherd boys are never thinking that, oh, somehow or other Krishna is facing everyone. They're not considering that. Just like when he lives over down hill, that would seem to be the most Aishwarya type of act. But it's not, because people actually think that Nanda Baba is holding it up with his stick, or the other suckers are holding it up, or Radharani is holding it actually Radharani is holding it up with her press, or the Govardhan himself is flying and actually holding himself up. But not that this little boy Krishna is actually holding up. They're not thinking like that. They're thinking Krishna obviously has something to do with it. But he's not the, the principle behind it. So they're not seeing with a view of his majesty. This is the difference. So understand this point very clearly, and then it'll make you appreciate his pastimes more significantly. So Krishna is facing everybody, and then it's described how each boy brings special prashada for the picnic. They all have wonderful mothers that we're going to discuss today, later. And they've all made exceptional preparations. So they all take these preparations out and they put their they make their lunch plates out of different materials like the rocks or the leaves or the baskets or the bark of trees and flowers, etc. This also indicates their individuality. It's not like a group consciousness institution. They are all realized individual, unique souls who only want to bring special, unique taste to Krishna, individual taste. This is why Krishna is so anxious to interact with every single boy, because they each have that jewel that he wants to taste, that only that boy has. And we're the same, actually, in this world. We also have that individual rasa with Krishna that no one in existence has. Only we have that, each individual person. So never try and become like everybody else, because that's not the heart of it. Just to appreciate our own um, personality and individuality. And that is what Krishna wants to taste. This aspect, so it's defined here by the way they put their lunch bags up. And then they shared their lunch bags. And they all relished all these different tastes, and they joked and laughed. And it's described in this part of the that one secretly takes a samosa and puts some flowers in it, and then they suck up and taste that and becomes very unhappy, and then they chase that person away who put the flowers in it. And it's also described because they're still little boys. Actually, I described yesterday that in this lila, they are just on the cusp. They're coming out of Komara lila. Komara, Balya lila, is actually the very end of Adasura. And this Brahma Vimohan is the very beginning of Pogana. So it hasn't, hasn't actually come yet. Because in the next pastime, which is the Nukasura, this is when the characteristics of Krishna's Pogana age are really accentuated and pulled out. 
while his feet become bigger and his waist is more narrow. So many things of this nature. So still, it's not quite in Polgondo age at this time. Say age levels because we did the other day. This is the wonderful <coughs> opportunity is having these seminars because most of the time it's the same people every day. So we don't have to keep repeating ourselves all the way through. I can say it one time and hope that you wrote it down so we don't have to keep repeating it again and again so we can carry on. How old is Poganda again? <laughs> <laughs> Who can tell me how old Poganda is? Not very nice. I described the other day from six to ten years old is Poganda. And prior to that, like between the age of five to six, is the cusp of Balya or Kumara. Kumara means very good. So this is baby Krishna. And so many specialities about baby Krishna. And then so many specialities about Hoganda Krishna. Hoganda Krishna is six years old. But as we were saying the other day, the ages in Vedic time are different to the ages now. We can't compare Krishna's six-year-old to a six-year-old today because Krishna was dancing with the Gopis when he was seven or eight years old. So we can't compare the ages as we do materially today. That we have to appreciate as a chintya shakti and try and understand that or accommodate that. Now at this point, you might have sometimes been in circumstances in India still today, I can remember when we'd go to print the books in Delhi, and sometimes we'd have to sit in the um, communal place where they took their tiffins. And even today, they are all helping themselves to each other's tiffin. They are offering, oh, I got this today. And I can remember when my son first went to school in Vrindavan, he opened his tiffin, and all the other boys looked in it and started taking everything out of it. He pulled it, but what are you doing? And then he noticed that everyone else was doing the same thing. They were all helping each other to their <laughs> other tiffins to and this is this is a very beautiful thing because it shows detachment from what's mine. Oh, this is mine. You know, it's a very open because when we come to eat, that's when our senses are most excited. And we want to make sure that what's on my plate is mine. You know, we don't want someone else picking it. But in this real transcendental world. The such pleasure in giving Krishna, particularly, these special tastes from their mother. And the devas are watching this, and Krishna is described as Yagya Bhak. He only accepts the food from the Yagya. And here he is, taking anything from all his suckers. And they're completely bewildered and astonished by this. We're making very splendid, wonderful offerings, you know, just all soaked in mantras, etc. And then perhaps Krishna will take by his mercy. But here these young boys, they're just taking something themselves even, and then putting it in Krishna's mouth. Seeing it taste sweet, and then giving it to Krishna. And Krishna's happily accepting this. This is astonishing for the devas. So this situation is happening. And they're all very happily taking their picnic. And at this time it's described that um, they're joking with the monkeys and so on at so that time. At this time, Krishna had a wish, his Satya Sankalpa Shakti, and his Leela Shakti are going to fulfill his wish. He wanted some obstacle for amusement. This is how Shri Krishna Chakra describes the next unfolding pastime, which is an enormous pastime actually, a very beautiful pastime. So then at this point when he wanted some further amusement, the cow boys noticed, and Krishna noticed, that the cows, the calves rather, had wandered away. This is another point, just to regress for one second, the difference in ages, Krishna is still <laughs> tending the calves. So he's still mathematically considered in Komara Lila or Bali Lila. Even though he's on the cusp of Hoganda Lila, he takes the cows out when he's in Hoganda Lila. And there's a big, big meeting. This is actually Gopaskami that we celebrate in the month of Kartu. This is when he's six years old and he has the official stamp that says, that now he can take out the cows. Now he's actually considered a much older type of person. Baby cutters remarkable. They have these split 
places in between, like the seasons also. It's like on Vasal Prana, the first day of spring. It's always a springful day. Even as the seasons get a little bit mixed, it's always a very special occasion. And the distinction between the seasons, what to speak of the ages themselves, are absolutely distinct to the day, to the very minute that Krishna moves into his other ages. So now they've noticed that the calves have strayed. And then um, Krishna, he reassures all the cowherd boys, don't worry, because they all immediately become concerned. They are very dutiful. They have their duty to perform, to take care of the calves. And there are demons around, as they notice, and they have to be very cautious about protecting the calves. So all of a sudden, the calves have wandered away from their tethering. So Krishna says, you all please stay here. You stay here and enjoy your picnic. I will be back in a moment. And actually he is back in a moment. A year later. <laughs> but he goes away searching for the calves. And it's described by Shukadeva Goswami, he's searching extensively. He's going in the caves, in the mountains, in the valleys, in the harsh stream grounds. He's going everywhere looking for the calves. He's really searching for them even though somehow he understands what's happening, but he's not sharing that cognition with everyone. He's making himself look like a very bewildered young cowboy boy. And then he, he can't find them. So then he comes back to the cowboy boys, and then to his astonishment, he sees they've all gone too. And then it's described in one verse by Shukadeva Goswami that he becomes quite bewildered <coughs> for a moment. He enacts some um, display of bewilderment. And then he immediately understands, oh, this is the work of Lord Brahma. But as Guru explained many times, how could Lord Brahma, who is born from a lotus flower, which means he has a material body, understand the transcendence or the transcendental nature of these spiritual suckers? These spiritual cowherd boys. He can't understand that. It's not in his uh, facility, capacity to understand. So it's described that actually Maya Devi created other cowherd boys and calves identical to allow Lord Brahma, the, Lord Brahma, the illusion of stealing those calves and cowherd boys. But actually, in reality, Yoga Maya herself had put all those suckers and calves into a state of like yoga nidra, like a timeless sleeping resting place. That's actually what Yoga Maya had arranged. Yes, another prakosh, which means like another chamber. These are Krishna's eternal suckers, his eternal friends. He wouldn't let any whisper of harm come to them. He loves them, they're dearer to him than his very life. So then it's described how um, Lord Brahma was thinking that Krishna would probably understand that it was Lord Brahma who had stolen the cars. And this is somewhat of a part of his offense that he was thinking that Krishna would probably come to him to beg him <coughs> to return to the cows and cattle boys. So Lord Brahma was actually thinking like this. And this is the Vimohan. Mohan means illusion. He was illusioned like this. So Krishna understood all immediately in fact. And now, just for the pleasure of the elder gopis, the mothers of Vrindavan, and the pleasure of the cows. This is why this whole pastime was arranged, because the mothers were all seeing the greatest fortune of Yashoda that she had Krishna on her lap, she was feeding Krishna, <coughs> dressing Krishna, massaging Krishna, talking with Krishna, playing with Krishna, and yet they didn't. They could also do a lot of those things, but they, it wasn't like full motherhood. They would also feed baby Krishna, but not in the same 
dependent way that Krishna would depend on Mother Yashoda. So they have this definite desire in their hearts to become like a true mother of Krishna. They wanted that. So Krishna wanted to fulfill all the desires of the bridge buses. And the cows also, they also had a desire to have Krishna as their calf. So when Krishna recognized that all the um, That was wasn't yeah, but that wasn't the same. So they, they wanted to marry just Krishna. And they married in this year. They married in this, I'm gonna describe. But it's not the same type of desire as it was with the gopis. The gopis directly wanted Krishna to nourish them. The young gopis wanted Krishna as their husbands, but they just wanted Rajendra Nanda Krishna as their husbands. It was a different consideration. It's described by Krishna. I'll come to it. It's, it's the one don't forget to remind me of that because that's Vishnu Prabhupada doesn't actually mention this I point. This is the most important. Yes, yes, yes. This we will come to this. Yes, definitely. So there's a, there's a build up. So um, <coughs> uh, Krishna manifests instantly all those cowherd boys and all those halves. And they are all directly Vishnu Tattva. They are all directly manifested from Him. And it's described extensively how they take on exactly the same characteristics, the same dress, the same clothes, etc. They are all 100% identical. So now Krishna, with these Vishnu um, transformations of Himself as the Cowboy boys, then he returns to Braj. Now this is amazing. On this day, as I said yesterday, Lord Balaram wasn't present by Yoga Maya's arrangement. So he didn't become stolen or transformed. So but Baladev also, he is illusioned into thinking that all these cowboy suckers are in their own identity still. He's not thinking for a single second that these are Vishnu manifestations. So then when they return to Braj, a phenomena takes place. Because normally, every time they return to Braj, when they reach Vasis, they hear the flutes and they see the clouds of dust being raised, and they understand Krishna's returning with the cars, they all become, they leave all their duties and they run to the royal road to welcome Krishna back. And all of them, previously to this day, have all ran to Krishna first, just to touch him and just to get his... <coughs> closeness, proximity with him, and to feel that sweetness from Krishna. But on this day, they don't. They all run to their own sons completely, and they shower all of their affection on their own sons. And then it's described how they take their sons home very jubilantly, and they begin to wash them and massage them and then start to feed them beautiful food stuff, and they become completely in excess. And then they start to breastfeed them. So this indicates they're still in this Kumara age, because in the Poganda age, that breastfeeding doesn't take place. Even though, remarkably enough, even when Krishna goes to Kurukshetra, and Krishna is about 70 or 80 years old, he sits on the lap of Mother Yashoda, and immediately she's filled with milk, and Krishna is described, takes that will at that age, sitting on the lap of Mother Yashoda. So this Leela is uh, <coughs> eternal. This mother is not Samyava. It supersedes anything else. Uh, mother, mother always sees son Yes, or even animals. today, we see in our own lives, you know, however old you are, your mother will always consider you her baby. So never try and tell your mother what to do. Because you can't, because she's, you know, your mother. <laughs> Wouldn't listen anyway. Um, like Rajanath just said, that um, when Mother Yashoda sees <coughs> in any of his ages, yes. she always actually sees the vision, yeah. and Krishna manifests the vision to her yes. of his baby, yes. his baby form. Yes. By so, love. Although, by love. Uh, by the influence of that Madhurya, that yeah. Sanya. That, yes. But sorry, in that mood, yes. Krishna appears to her always like that. Right. And it's not that she's 
experiencing that he, as the full-grown adult and king in Gorka, was sitting on his lap. She actually experienced oh, yes. that he's a baby. I didn't make that clear. Yeah. You understand what that love is? But she's not thinking, oh, he's gray hair, or he doesn't have any gray hair. But she's not, they're not, she's not thinking for one second. It's just like when he appears to Devaki, he's killed Kaksa. For a moment, he wants to melt their Aishwarya mood towards him. And he appears as a little boy that he wants Devaki to actually put him on her lap and rest him, which is her secret. Desert. But she doesn't. It's described that Devaki never gives milk to Krishna. So how special are all these... Yes, it's described. Twice it's described. What? She doesn't. The Devaki doesn't actually give milk to Krishna. Because it's described in the Putana pastime, how special it is that Putana even gave her milk to Krishna. But Krishna Chakravarti comments at that time that not even Devaki had that privilege of giving milk to Krishna. He doesn't say any more than that. Yeah, when he appeared, he just manifested as a sister. But when he came back, back to Mathura, that time was the... No. There's no, no they, they only regarded him. All, understand this point very clearly. Understand all the Mathura Vasis and the Dwarka Vasis always saw Krishna as God. They had, and they saw themselves as very much connected to God. They saw themselves as very powerful. Many of them were demigods and devas, etc. So they were also like God themselves, but they were respecting Krishna as the supreme Paramatma, the supreme soul of all. They had witnessed all his miracles and they understood he could do anything. So they were always, this was like, this is their Sai Bhav. So for Devaki and Vasudev to break that or purify it, Krishna tries, it's described, after the killing of Kamsa. It's described that he actually tries, he wants to create that, but it doesn't happen. Uh, one time, I thought it different thing, like the Jiva Goswami explained. Uh, yes, please. Uh, please uh, and, uh, I'm sure there are many it's one time. various, yeah, just a second, there are many various <coughs> commentaries, I was talking about them yesterday, and perspectives on the, because most of these commentaries are written in their Samadhi Bhastya. They're written in their deep meditation. So that meditation that Shiva Vishnam Chakravarti Thakur has a very special uniqueness that is not the same as Shiva Jiva Goswami's meditation on this part. And another point is that all these pastimes are so variable anyway, they can actually ultimately accommodate all different perspectives simultaneously. It's not like Sanat Goswami describes that the Keshi demon or the Kaliya demon is actually used like a chariot for Krishna to go to Mathura at the end, but this is in another day of Lord Brahma. So there are many, many, this is the beauty of discussing the Krishna's life. Not just for this life, we have enough homework, <coughs> ten more lives, to actually go over all this, this variety of considerations. Maharaj, you had some Both of these commentaries are translated by those who do not have to be. There's this all consideration by much more. So. I don't understand what is that? I don't understand. Because they produce. Guru Dev said, we may read so many books, but if they have been translated by someone who is not split up, who is not perfect, realized, then we maybe get 20% of the actual content. It's like the Bhakti Vedanta Swami's books. There's a special sweetness in all his commentaries because they were translated directly under his guidance by his shishyas. But some of the, many of the other books, they're not of that caliber. So there is room for error. Well, the the block IP. Nevertheless, we can take, it's all we've got, it's like a blind eye. We can take the best way. That's why I'm telling, I have to watch some things. I will check it. But, yeah, yeah, okay. Mara. Gurudev told the story that at the same time that at the same time that Krishna gave Devaki the benediction and returned her six sons that had been killed by Kansa, yes. that he also gave her his the benediction of taking her breast milk that one time. Ah, okay, thank you.
So there is a time when the sad Garbhas, her six sons, were returned by Krishna. My Countess Maharaj is, is sharing that actually at that time Krishna gave her the benediction that she could <coughs> give her breast milk to Krishna at that time. But as a general rule, it's not really there because the nature of that Madhurya is actually <coughs> is described in this pastime of this all the milk that Krishna was drinking from the mothers was their liquid cream. This was the specific, that's how can that liquid cream exist in a Dwarkavasi or a Maturavasi to anything like the same degree. There might have been some moments, but the real essence of that milk is liquid cream. And another consideration here is it's this cream that controls the supreme controller. It's like we were told in the first, I think, Maharaj mentioned how Gurudev had come to tell us that your Prabhupada has said that Krishna is the supreme controller, and I've come to tell you actually he's not. So who is the supreme controller in these leaders? It is praying herself that is controlling the all-independent Lord. Krishna becomes totally dependent on the Brijvasi's love for him, because there's another pastime later on that he used to always do a drama in, in uh, Nanda Bhavan, in Nandagam when all the bridge buses are saying, we think that your son is God. And then Nanda Baba will start to laugh and laugh. How could this be? You haven't even developed your milk teeth. You're 80 years old, but even you've still got your baby teeth. You're really foolish. You can't understand that he's not possibly God. So, um, what am I saying? That, <coughs> that, Oh yes, so uh, Krishna, Nanda Baba is saying that he cries when he's hungry. You know, he becomes unhappy when he needs to rest or whatever. There's always these, this mood of dependence on the gopas and the gopis completely. And certainly when we come to the more rustic descriptions, he's utterly dependent on the love of Sri Radha. In Rasa Vichar, he's completely dependent on Radha. But in Tattva Vichar, he's totally independent. So only devotees by chanting Hare Krishna and empowered by the personality of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu can appreciate and understand these topics. These topics were never ever opened up prior to 500 years ago. It wasn't 5,000 years ago that people understood these topics. It was under lock and key until Chaitanya Mahaprabhu burst that dam of praying to benedict these fallen people in Kali Yuga and blessed we are and take these blessings to understand what is this ashraya as I've just described and what is the meaning of this ashrita these other <coughs> giving us this so take it drink it it's our property because we have the stamp of Mahaprabhu and the Rasik Vaishnavas in particular without that we wouldn't understand anything so um, when he arrives back, as I described, all the mothers take such remarkable care and joy in their sons. They don't quite know why, consciously, that they have so much attraction to their sons. They're not thinking, oh, this is Krishna. But they have that exact same mood that Mother Yashoda has for Krishna. And the cows also. When the calves come into the pens in the evening time, the mothers begin mooing and mooing and mooing, and when they see their calves, they almost break free from the boundaries of the gopas in anxiety to reach their calves and nourish them. And it's described they're licking their calves like they want to swallow them. They're just licking and licking and licking their calves. And this is the nature that the mothers are just totally satisfied. The mother cows, what to speak of the mother gopis, the uh, gopas, gopis. So everyone is in a, submerged in an ocean of praying for these 12 months. And then it's described that during this time, Gargaracharya, he comes into the village. And then he says, actually the constellations all say this is the best age, best time for making betrothals. So as Brajanath was probably saying, all of the um, almost six-year-old uh, gopas are betrothed to all the gopis whose fervent desire is to have Krishna as their husbands. So they all actually become married because betrothal in Vedic culture is not different to marriage. 
it means for life you will be with this particular festival. So then they are betrothed, or many festivals taking place just like when we go and brush. Every night they crank up the wedding music and so on. Brush they like, this is the life of brush. Now they sort of replace it with electronic music. But previously, but that joyous mood, that free festivity, is still present in the brunch today. There's still a flavor. How can it not be? The very atmosphere of brunch is contained in the dust of Vrindavan. The dust of Vrindavan is the same dust as was there 5,000 years ago. So when we go to Vrindavan, it's the dust that holds the jewels, in fact. And how do you access that? By putting your head to that constantly, or rolling in that, or being close to that, and in mood being close to that. And you see the bridge buses are still, many, very much carrying these moods. So now, five or six days before the... Okay, I'm not going to go into this, but what's it now? To be the husband. Okay, I'll talk to you about that. He's talking about Katyani Brat, but that's a good one. Let me finish this last night. There are so many aspects to this. The Katyani Brat is a different flavor. But here, this is about Lord Brahma and the bridge buses. So now, five or six days later, the Gopas are with the cows on the top of Govardhan Hill. Not on the top. Govardhan Hill was around about two miles high. So they're in the higher pasturing grounds. And they suddenly see down in the valley, they see with the cowherd boys are the younger calves. These calves are one year old practically by this time. These mother cows have already had new calves. They've had younger calves. But when these mothers see their older calves, these one-year-old calves who are expansions of Krishna, down in the valley below, it's described that they break free from the boundaries of the Gopas and they run down this very difficult path of Govardhan Hill with pebbles and stones and bushes. It's not a place where a cow would normally run down. They not only run, but they run very fast, as described, with their necks stretched out and their tails up high. Have you seen a cow running when it's got its tail up straight? It's really going somewhere, you know, it's got an intention. So it's running fast down this hill, almost to a degree where they can break their legs. And the gopas are really angry and disturbed that why have they endangered themselves in such a foolish way running down the hill like this. And they're running, trying to stop them, trying to fend them off from actually hurting themselves. And, find, and they arrive in the, in the valley at the bottom. And the mothers, of course, immediately go to their calves, these one-year-old calves. But the cowherd men, who are so angry and irritated and disturbed by the cows, immediately melt on seeing their darling sons. When they see their sons in front of them, then they immediately melt, just as the cows melted, and they grab their son and they embrace their sons, and they smell their hands, heads, and they sow their sons in their tears of affection. So Bharam, he's watching this phenomenal scene. Somehow Yoga Maya has begun to lift the veil, because Bharam, as we said at the beginning, wasn't included in this pastime from the very beginning. He's still Baladev in his full identity. So he saw the cows come down, he saw them go to the cows, and he saw the remarkable nature of these angry gophers suddenly melted when they saw their sons, when they became completely affectionate. And he's wondering, what's going on here? What, what, what phenomenon is this? And then he looks closer and closer, and then gradually it's described like in two or three stages that Yoga Maya lifts the curtain. This is a heavy thing. It's a big emotional <coughs> impact as I'm going to describe for Baladev, that actually these Calvert boys are not who he thought they were. Baladev is omniscient. Baladev holds all the universes on his head. How can Baladev not know what's happening? But at this time, Krishna has covered even Baladev with his yoga mind. So, so Baladev is really described as quite bewildered by this. And he thinks at one point he starts to see this other energy is 
prevalent and he's starting to think, is this some demon energy that has actually come into play? Or is it by the sages or the demigods? Who's actually doing all this? And then he looks a bit closer and then Krishna, or Yoga Maya rather, lifts a little bit more of it. And eventually, to his utter astonishment, he sees that all these Kalma boys, these suckers, are actually Vishnu Tattva. They're all Vishnu forms. They're all coming from Krishna. Baladeva is astonished when he sees like this. And then at this point, he looks to Krishna and just in a glance and a few facial expressions, <coughs> Krishna describes to him what happened. Because two supremely high personalities, they don't have a lot of words, they can just in codes explain, actually this is all Brahma illusioning you know, himself by thinking he can test my mystic potency. And Balaram, he realizes this, and he's quite, quite stunned. He's actually utterly astonished. And he turns to Krishna and says, well, why didn't you tell me about this? And Krishna says, because I knew you would miss Sridhar too much. If I had told you Sridhar was going to become under the influence of Yoga Maya for a whole year, you would not have survived. Your love for Sridhar is too thick. It's too deep. So I couldn't tell you that. So I had to maintain this covering on your consciousness. And Baladev Prabhu, actually, Jiva Goswami describes, is not at all happy with this. He doesn't come out cow raising with Krishna for the next five days after this fasta. <laughs> he just stays at home with Mother. He won't come out with Krishna. He's actually unhappy that his dear, most confidential friend didn't reveal to him this confidential pastime. He's quite unhappy about it, so he stays home. Well, then, how come Krishna didn't feel separation from Sri Dham and all the Calvin boys? I don't have an off pad. I have it right here in front of me. So I thought you had the note, so I was just giving it a chance. It says, Vishnu Chuck Ruddy Tucker. You're cheating. You got the no, I'm assisting. Tell us, tell us. <laughs> So what, you told me to do this. Yes, 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 yes. Because Krishna in an expanded form was still with them. Uh -huh, and Baladev uh -huh. didn't go out that day, so yes, he wasn't. Yes, yes. So Krishna was in that yoga nidra space with those suckers. He was never actually separated from them. Rajanath mentioned this before about how Gurudev explained this. Yes. And Actually, the way that it was, Gurudev was testing us to see if we understood was it when, when Gurudev was in Miami. Uh -huh. And I think he was working on that when he was 10th to Canada. I think I remember this whole yeah. time. And then Shil Gurudev, then he said, how many groups of coward boys were there? So then Gurudev revealed to us that there was a third group. Okay. There yes. was the first group, which is the actual covered boys. Yes. I'll take and it by then mind. there's the Maya covered boys. Yes. Right? Yes. And then, then there is what is there is, what is created by Yoga Maya. Yes. Krish in another Prakosh, yes. not Yoga Nidra. Right. Not that they're sleeping right. on that Prakosh. Okay. Okay. But actually the exact pastime is still going on. Uh, uh, like you are taking a picnic for one year. Right. But in this, Shukadeva Goswami, specifically, because at the end of this um, pastime, when Krishna finally returns, they say, oh, you were only away for a second. That's how they comment. So this is in, the understanding is in time and space to appreciate this fully. So Maharaj is sharing that there's actually three Yes. Groups yes. of there's the Mayak ones, the Yoga Maya ones, and the original ones we can say, who are still in another prakosh means chamber, another prakosh performing these pastimes. So actually, in answer to my Kaniswaran's question, which is already answered, is that they were never separated from Krishna. But Baladev was, and Baladev was supported and nourished by the Vishnu Murti or the Vishnu expansion of Krishna, that was sufficient. The pastimes themselves were sufficient. That's my understanding. What if Vishnu Chakravarti says Krishna did not
suffer from any separation because he was close to them in an expanded form of that church for their calves. So the pastime for them, as Gurudev said, is still going on, uh, but it's in a different approach. Just like when Uddhava came to Vrindavan, yes. first he saw Vrindavan without separation, yes. and then he saw Vrindavan with separation. Yes. All are going on simultaneously. Yes. But Krishna can also mess with time, so even though they were enjoying that picnic for a year, yeah. at the end of it, it may seem like a moment. Yes. Just like Ras Lila. Yes. And, even though it's the night of Brahma. I was thinking about today when Uddhava yeah. went to deliver the message to the gopis in, and that Udhakiri pastime, and he told them to close their eyes and to just remember Krishna. And during that closing of the eyes, which was like a second, time was compressed, and the entire Ras Lila a four billion, three hundred twenty million years took place in that moment for the gopis. And then they opened their eyes after a moment for Uddhava and they were very satisfied. They were happy with Uddhava. He delivered the message. So it's, it's right, that compression of time. So it's a dynamic of this nature, the reality that Gurudev has actually, you know, revealed to us through this. So there's the pastime on one level, then there's the pastime on another level, and the pastime on another level. On infinite levels, we can churn these pastimes over till we leave on. This is why Parishit, right at the very beginning, is saying these are like newer and newer and newer. He hasn't even heard them before. I can remember listening to Bhakti Surya Shrikant Maharaj talk about Damanavi one time in uh, Sailor Kash. And we've heard it so many times, but he was bringing in so many other aspects from the Acharyas to embellish it. So it's like this. I gotta finish for about ten minutes. Just one I was gonna to touch on the Nuka Sura also, but the Nuka can't even come into play today. Never mind. All the colored boys they got married. Uh, yes. But why Krishna go around they don't get married? What's the question? He wants to know why Krishna and Balaram didn't get married amongst all the other marriages that took place at that time. So I throw that out to you. <laughs> Tell us, Maharaj. You know, Brenda, what you said? No. Why did not Krishna and Balaram get married or engaged or betrothed at the same time as all the other cowherd boys got betrothed in that year when Krishna was exciting himself? Why did he not get? I mean, Yoga Maya didn't arrange for that. We know the story when actually always Kirtida and Mother Yashoda and Rishabhanda and Nanda want Radha and Krishna to be married. But there's the story of Yogamaya arranging for them not to be married. There's a time when Radharani has that haldi, that turmeric paste put on her hands by Mother Yashoda in Nandagam where she's cooking. And then she washes it off in that pili puka. And then all the residents of Barshana think, oh, Radharani's had a proposal from Mother Yashoda. And then they start exchanging gifts. And then everyone becomes joyous because they're sure that this wedding is going to take place. But then uh, Punamasi comes in and is very happy to hear the news, but does an astrological chart, which is actually all the first 11 houses are totally compatible with these two getting married. But the final 12th house says that one of these two must die if they get married. So that's like the end. And then a few weeks later, Kodamasi declares, actually, Radha Rani should marry Abhimanyu. Oh my God, this person? You know, Jotila and Kotila, the least liked practically in Braj, the most cantankerous family, always complaining, never had enough. And Radha Rani, most beautiful Radha Rani, but Kodamasi is the Mahant. Kodamasi, Kodamasi is the mystic city. She's the, the personality who presides over Braj. Then they must follow her order. So Radha Rani marries Abhimanyu. For Parakya In this situation also, all the coward boys and all the gopis, they were getting married. So all became very happy. Yes. But then, Kodamasi came and she thought, these two boys, Holiday and Krishna, if they get married, big problem will come. <laughs> yeah. uh, they will 
career, then the whole future here yeah, will be unfortunate. So they should look at that. So Rajanath is saying that the has been revealed. I think it's saying something also in Yogam Chandra or something a little bit at the end. But that um, Unamasi is telling that if Krishna and Balaram marry along with everybody else, there will be great misfortune for them and for the whole of Raj. So they should not marry at this time. So they don't need to marry. So he asked the question, but he already knew the answer. So I don't know the answer to this. Somebody else. No, no. Listen. So um, then finally, <coughs> Lord um, Brahma, he returns, actually, it's described, he just goes to Satyaloka and comes straight back because he's actually refused entrance because there's an impersonator who's sitting on his throne and the gatekeepers have been told to send away another impersonator who comes pretending to be Lord Brahma. You understand? Krishna's gone ahead and is impersonating Lord Brahma on Lord Brahma's throne. So when the real Lord Brahma comes, Krishna has directed the gatekeepers as a false Brahma around. Don't let him in, chase him away. So when Lord Brahma comes to his own gate, he's chased away by his own guards. And then he starts to think, what's happening here? Because Krishna wanted to hurry him back, make sure it was only one year, because in that time, it was one year. So when Lord Brahma comes back, then he comes to give back the cowboy boys. But then he sees to his astonishment that all the calves and all the boys are still there exactly as he left them. So then he becomes really astonished and he looks with one, two heads to his cave where he's hidden them, and looks to these new boys, these Vishnu Murtis, and he sees them both and then he becomes more and more, then he uses all his mystic omniscience, which is not like Baladev because as I said earlier, he's born from a lotus, he's material, Lord Brahma. So he only has the conditioned consciousness ultimately. He can't understand and becomes more and more bewildered. And then suddenly, Krishna reveals all these Vishnu Murti forms of Himself. They all become Bala, uh, Lord Brahma's Ishtadev. They all become, actually, His Ishtadev is Garandakshai Vishnu. They all, He sees all of them as they're in their Vishnu forms. And He's completely um, bewildered and described that He was trying to exhibit His own power to cover something so much more powerful. It's not possible, it's like a glowworm in the day it has no power. So when Lord Brahma, he looked at all the boys, they had a bluish color of rain clouds and silken garments. And also the calves had the same. And then it's described that he saw them all with four arms and beautiful complexions, garments, etc. And all the boys' chests were marked with the Sri Vatsa, that line of Lakshmi. And they had beautiful armlets and Kasturba jewels were on their necks of all of them. And bracelets and ankle belts, they were all holding conch, mace, disc and lotus. And helmets, earrings, garlands, sacred belts, all extremely beautiful. Every part of their body was beautifully decorated. And many devotees were worshipping them. This is what Lord Brahma saw. He just didn't say, see the splendor of Lord Vishnu. He saw millions of entities worshipping each particular Vishnu. This is why I wrote it down. I want to say this. How many were worshipping? This is why that Tulsi was chanting. And these forms, they all had pure smiles, like increasing the light of the moon. And then all creatures from insects up to Lord Brahma were worshipping these Vishnu Murtis from the blade of grass. They were all worshipping these forms of Vishnu and they were surrounded by opulences. And the Ananasida, the mystic potencies and the 24 elements and the Mahatattva, all personified, were worshipping these forms of Lord Vishnu. And then Lord Brahma, he saw time personified, worshipping Lord Vishnu. He saw Svabhav, one's own nature, personified, worshipping Vishnu. He saw the sun stars, the reformation, the worshipping Vishnu. He saw calm, desire, <coughs> worshipping Vishnu. He saw uh, karma, fruitive activities. He saw the gunas. He saw all the demigods, all worshipping each particular hundreds of thousands of Vishnus. Imagine that. 
sight you must have been. So astonishing. And it's described at this point that Lord Brahma, seeing all this, his eleven senses were jolted by astonishment, and he was stunned by this transcendental exhibition and bliss and became completely silent. He couldn't say a thing. He was totally overwhelmed. And it's described like a child plays with a clay doll in the presence of the deity. And then Krishna withdrew that vision to Lord Brahma because Lord Brahma was not qualified to see anymore. And then he <coughs> revealed himself just as a small cowherd boy. And then he starts very beautifully, Krishna, to reveal the beauty of Vrindavan to Lord Brahma. This is described by Shukadev Goswami. But then he starts to reveal the sweetness of Vrindavan, the trees, etc. And the lakes and the beauty of the birds and so on. And the atmosphere of Vrindavan. This is even more beautiful than this previous Aishwarya exhibition that he just demonstrated. He's trying, as any great personality, to always give the benefit, the good, even though Lord Brahma has committed some offense here. But still, Krishna is trying to benedict him and trying to elevate his consciousness to Madhuri by showing this. And then it's described how Lord Brahma, he jumps down from his swan carrier, and of course the demigods, they never touch this earth. But this time, the king, the height, the creator of the demigods, he gets down and touches the earth out of humility. And he bows his head down with his crowns. And he's weeping and weeping and weeping, offering prayers to Krishna. Actually, he can't speak for a long time. He's soaking the earth with his tears of astonishment. He's just been through the most profound. Lord Brahma is an amazing personality, filled with emotions and so on and this staggering um, situation has just taken place in his heart. He's seen the opulence of Krishna more than he could have even begun to consider previously. And he's also seen the absolute sweetness of Krishna. And then he begins to offer beautiful prayers and he's given up his prestige of being a great demigod and it's described here by Shri Vishnu that Shri Goswami is describing this pastime in the present. He's not describing it as something that happened before because Shri Goswami is witnessing this pastime directly in his Samadhi Basya, in his meditation. He's seeing it. So this is another dynamic of the pastime that is happening right now. And Shukadev is giving this impression to Parikshit Maharaj. And then it's described that Krishna apparently returns to the original Kalman voice. Lord Rama, after his prayers, actually in the next chapter, there's a specific chapter, chapter 14, which is just Lord Rama's prayers. And, but prior to that, the end of the pastime is described where Krishna goes back to join the original Kalman voice. And then you just say, oh, you were just away for a moment. And this is what it seems like. And then they continue their picnic. And then they return to Braj as their own identities. Now, this is another big transition. All of a sudden, Krishna is no longer all the power boys and cars. So how does Krishna make that reconciliation? It's described that he inspires a great festival at this particular time when he returns. And Krishna is at the center of the festival, as always, because, specifically, Agasura is going to be described now. Agasura wasn't told to the Prajapasis before this day, because Agasura happened a year ago, but that year has somehow or other been compressed and been obliterated from the Prajapasis. Do you understand the time situation? Do you understand? Some are still in the forest. Huh? Sakas were the whole year in the forest. Yes, the Sakas haven't actually been home. The real so they are thinking it's like you've been going to a coma for a year and you come out of it and you don't know you've been in a coma. It was like that. They just came back to where they were previously. 
but how are the hearts of the mothers reconciled? And the hearts of the mother cows also reconciled. And Jiva Goswami specifically relates to this festival, this wonderful festival that took place when they returned. It's called Goldjuli. Go means the cow and Juli means dust at the time of the Krishna returns. There was this magnificent festival to celebrate the return of Krishna, which is a festival in itself, but also the killing of Agasura Dhimma, who was frightening all the demigods. So this created an opportunity to have the most wonderful festival. And by the height and extraordinary nature of this festival, this transition took place between the gopis and hearts as being mother of Krishna directly and getting back to their normal wood. Because when Krishna returns now with the Kama wood, they all run to Krishna. They no longer run to their own sons first. And the mother cows, they're only looking to Krishna. Their calves haven't become quite as attractive as they were previously. So there has to be some transition there. So Jiva Goswami is describing this uh, pastime of this wonderful, wonderful heart-melting festival which takes place there. So this is just one pastime that I've spoken for maybe just a bit more than an hour. So I just wanted to say here, I only have two more class slots here. So I'm obviously not going to finish all the demons. And it, I didn't really want to finish all the demons. I can, we can go briefly through. But I want you to relish them yourselves and pick up this Bhagavatam itself. The purpose of these descriptions is to inspire you personally. This is only one day in a whole 12 months. But you should also be having this Bhagavatam daily. Be drinking this beverage. Be very familiar with the first nine characters and then know what is the nature and the taste of this um, tenth canto. Because this is our prayogen. This is the ashram. So we must appreciate it. When the class come back, would it take like two years old class? No, because time has been compressed. And there's like the boys themselves don't grow during that time. It's not that they grow a year. Because actually, as I just said, it's like that year has been omitted from their very lives. But it doesn't even actually exist as far as a continuum of growth is concerned. It's not there. So the, the, the cars will stay with their mother who wasn't aware that it was Then they are their beautiful cars, still their beautiful, you know, early cars. Even though there were other cars born in the interim during that year. If we can't understand it, that's good. It is a chintya. You cannot, as we've described, all these billions of people who live in a little village of Brudge, you know, how, how is it possible to materially reconcile? But we should think about these things. And if we chant, remembering these things, Krishna will give us the reconciliation in the heart. Through Guru. But what complicates that a little bit more, the inconceivability of expression of time and all of that, right. is that one of the things that uh, was a clue to validate that he was what, well, what's going on here when he saw that there was so much affection. Yes. Because the fact is that the cows were coming down the over down the hill yes. to see their calves, yes. which were one year older. Yes. And they, in the meantime, yes. they already had new calves. Yes. And that's the suspicious thing to validate. Yes. How is it that they're showing more affection to their older calves, one-year-old calves, yes. than they are to their new ones? This is very strange. Yes. And let me begin to... Play. So it's a hiccup in the whole thing, yeah. having those, <laughs> one, those new calves born. <clears throat> How could those new calves exist if that <clears throat> wasn't really on the map, so to speak? Right. The, I don't know. So it's only not on the map in the cowherd box. Everybody else, they just went along as normal. Right. It's only the cowherd boys were in the other coach. Right. And then um, it's described how Agasur, they're playing on the bones of Agasur. Why are they playing on the bones and desiccated body if it uh, was a year? But somehow, for them, it was a year too. And another thing is... It's like Nityananda Prabhu. He would play all night with the boys, all day, all night. Nobody cared. And nobody kept track of time. So the cowboy boys were just out there for that whole time. 
they're also growing. The calves are growing. So they come back into it. They weren't necessarily with going home every night, but that doesn't even occur to them. Because even the scholars become bewildered. Yeah, because they were happy. <laughs> they were with, I mean, if they go Suddenly they're all betrothed. So it went on. So that year had a lot of substance because they were all betrothed. But did they. Yogamaya fills in the gaps. <laughs> yeah, okay, she has to fill in our gaps too. <laughs> Actually, it's described, Vishnu Chakravarti Tantra describes how she, in phases, yes. reveals to Brahma and to Balaram yes. first this, then yes. this, then yes. this, then yes. this. So actually, we are in process of having the phases here. Yeah. So this is the first phase, and the next year will be the second, and the third is How can we expect us to be quite ahead and understand all of these things immediately? So we've got these intellectual questions that we're analyzing it with materially, but actually, there are answers to all these. And I would maybe probably say just chant Hare Krishna and worship your guru. Well, oh, you cannot understand. One more question. <laughs> which, which demon did we discuss today? We discussed the demon of illusion. This, uh, let me, we will run out of time, but we'll just quickly go here because we can't leave this part now. Uh, let me see. Um, very simple. Free us from the cultivation of fruitive activities, karma, and speculation knowledge. By hearing about this pastime, we'll become freed from cultivating karma and jnana, trying to do something ourselves. And it's described, uh, that's it, that's as much as Bhakti Nautak was given on it. And I described the other day when we talked about Madhavacharya, how Madhavacharya did include this chapter in his Bhagavatam commentary. He omitted it completely because he didn't want the Adi Guru of our Samradaya to look like he was actually bewildered. He wouldn't even go there. So Bhakti Gautapo also, he just says it's speculation and uh, trying to develop your own mystic potency, etc. He also warns in that commentary about being bewildered by the flowery words of the Vedas. Right. Because Brahma is the original source of all Vedic literature, he's completely learned, but he got a little sidetracked yes. with all of that because the Vedas can be a little indirect as well. You all heard this very important. That Lord Brahma has become bewildered by the flowery words of the Vedas to some degree. Because he also, also he has become bewildered by that, thinking that he can actually do something superior to that Supreme Brahma. He can actually influence Krishna by his own mystic potency. So this is like the demoniac mentality that we can be greater than Krishna. So through our jnana and activities and so on, this is purified by hearing it. This pastime, by the way, takes place in Vatsavan, which is close to Kamyavan, which is just around the corner from Ramaka. Krishna's greatness cannot be measured by the intellect. Even one of unsurpassed and topmost quality of intellect, intelligence, and learning in this world cannot touch an atom of Krishna's glory. This is exactly what these past are supposed to inspire as questions and answers. Ah, very nice.